hallelujah you've bled the most where you've bled the most i'll complete the sentence shortly for you welcome everyone thank you so much for joining the title for tonight's sermon is where you've bled the most is where a lot of things will happen the most for you if you stick around then you'll hear how we'll finish this sentence I just want to remind you of something before we delve into the meat of the matter remember that this Saturday the Saturday of Memorial Weekend we're going to be in Massachusetts for the Massachusetts encounter that Saturday May 25 and the location is Double Tree by Hilton Hotel, Boston North Shore, 50 Ferncroft Road, Danvers, Massachusetts, 01923. Of course, when you enter, uh, you should see a sign directing you to the room, or you could always ask the person at the front desk. It will be a miraculous night. Tell two people, it will be a miraculous night. It'll be the night when someone will finally be freed from torment, freed from years of pain and suffering, freed emotionally, mentally, and otherwise. And we cannot wait to celebrate with such an individual. Amen? Hallelujah. Please turn your Bible to the book of Acts. And we're at Acts chapter 1 this evening. How did we get here? Well, you do know that... There is a countdown happening to Pentecost. Usually Pentecost is 50 days, I believe, from Passover. So yes, it's about that time when Pentecost is observed. And of course, you know that if that is the case, then the people who are within the Jewish community will be making the necessary preparations for Pentecost. Here in Christendom, we might not celebrate it heavily or to a great extent, but I know that we do observe the different times and the different feasts in the Bible. Passover, although we might call it something else, Easter celebrations, we do observe these things because during the time of Jesus' ministry, these celebrations were pivotal. In fact, the Father allowed for very important things to transpire during these festivals and seasons and so we remember them amen as we remember our lord jesus so pentecost of course every time we think of pentecost we remember not just the lord jesus but we remember his apostles even more correct good so this evening we're going to talk about something um of course from scripture the base text will be taken from Acts chapter 1. And I believe that we're going to start by reading a few verses. We'll stop wherever the Holy Spirit bids us to stop. As you join, you know exactly what to do. And that is to hit that share button that is just below the video. By doing so, you'll allow your friends and loved ones, people you know as well as those you don't even know, to benefit from the holy word of truth that shall go forth tonight. If you're watching on TikTok, Facebook, or YouTube, remember to also give the video a like before you listen in any further. Please do so quickly. Amen. And of course, encourage others in the comments to share, like, and subscribe right? My name is Shadeen Anglin, and I'm delighted to be here to serve you, okay? And I really hope you enjoy tonight's meal. Tell two people it's a fresh meal from the Holy Spirit, and we like fresh food around here. I'm hungry. Are you? <laughs> I'm so hungry. I'm hungry. Is there anybody else who wants something fresh to eat? We're going to break bread this evening, and I really hope that the bread that will be broken will be fulfilling to your spirit man this evening. Amen? Yes. Fresh meal, shells chosen, the journey, Drea. All of that long name. Hello, how are you doing? Good to, good to have you. Um, Janice, good to have you. Wanda, Vivian, Sharma, Tasanya. You got to share so we can get started. I, I'll give you 30 seconds more to share. <laughs> okay. 
30 more seconds and I'm hoping that during that time I'll see Melissa. I've not seen her in a while. Uh, Candy, Sister Georgia. Yes, we're going to eat together. Antoinette, Arlene, Beckford, Whitney. Please ensure that you're hitting that share button so that other people <laughs> might benefit from tonight's teachings. You don't want to be selfish, right? Right, Angela? Okay, so let's just breathe a word of prayer quickly as we acknowledge our King. Family, I just want to say this as often as I can that I am who I am today because of the grace, only the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only because of his grace why I'm able to stand before you and do what I do. I deliver because of him. In the manner in which I deliver, it's only because of him. I can look you in the eyes and tell you, thus saith the Lord, only because of his grace. I'm here only because of his grace, okay? I want you to know that it's a privilege to stand and even say that I dare not boast or brag in anything that I have accomplished or anything that I think I'm capable of doing or anything that I think I have achieved because of my own doing. No, I rebuke me if that's the case. I am here standing before you. And I'm about to deliver the word of God under the guidance of the Holy Ghost and in his might and power only because of his grace. Make no mistake with that. Do you hear me? Tell two people Shadeen is here only because of his grace. Okay? Man has not done it for me. Man gets no credit for what God has done for me. It has been a journey with just Adonai and I. And I want you to know, he has been faithful. And the reason why I've succeeded at anything at all, have been victorious in many battles, even the public ones, it's only because of his grace and his love for me. I want you to know that all the time. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We ask that you speak, open up our hearts, open up our ears, open up our eyes, increase our understanding tonight. We pray that you alone will be seen and exalted. We pray that you alone will be heard. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done tonight. As you speak unto the hearts of your people, thank you for preparing the way. Thank you for the power. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit through which this and so much more is possible. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I want to see Sister Angela on YouTube. I just need like 50 more people to hit like so that other people might know we're live tonight. Of course, it's not usual or typical for us to be here on a Monday evening. Um, Kareem, if you've not yet liked the stream, please do so. Acts chapter 1. Let's go. I'll read from verse 1. Is that okay? The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs 
being seen of them and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the, the promise of the Father, which said he that you have heard of me. Our base scripture is going to be taken from verse 4. So I want to repeat it for you. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Please type this in the comments. Do not depart from where you are. Please put this in the comments. Do not depart from where you are. I'll speak to two people on TikTok. Do not depart from where you are. Wallace, do not depart from where you are. Esther, do not depart from where you are. Let's continue to read. But wait for the promise of the Father. Let me say this to you as well. Wait. Do not depart, but wait. Do not depart, but wait, my sister. Do not depart, Carlene, but wait. Hallelujah. Let's go to verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days since, or hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons with the Father, or which the Father has put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And we will pause the reading there. Now, if you have been following the ministry for at least three years now, then I'm sure you would have been familiar with us delving into Acts chapter one. I'm sure it's not the first time we have read Acts chapter one in this manner. However, as you know, sometimes you can get different food or different things, nutritional value from one text, spiritually speaking. You can delve into one text 10 different times and on each occasion you get something different, okay? Or maybe what you get is a little deeper than what you got the first time. And that is what makes scripture so amazing. And that is why, let me tell you, there are times when I say to myself, okay, Lord, I feel like I've preached at least 600 messages already. I feel like I've preached every message in the Bible except in the book of Revelation. So you know at times I'm like, Father, is there anything else to talk about or preach about? But here's the thing. When you really look at it, the more you grow, the more you have experiences, is the more when you revisit scripture, you get a different understanding. Sometimes you'll find that you understand it from a different perspective. And I guess that is where the opening of one's appetite comes in. Because when you realize that there's more to something that you thought was locked in on a certain level, it's very enthusing and also inspiring. It, it's something that will make you just want to keep wanting more, keep searching, keep reading, keep researching, keep studying. Okay, so here we are back in Acts chapter 1. And we're going to be bringing out a certain theme. And it, of course, aligns with what I told you is the title for tonight's sermon. So are you ready for us to delve? Are we ready? Are we ready, Sister Laverne, Onila, Jereen, Marva, Caribbean Queen, are you ready? Idalisha, who looks like she's watching from somewhere in Africa, are you ready for us to delve? Are you ready? 
to be served? I'm ready. Queen Carol says she's ready. Danielle says she's ready too. Minerva is also ready. And I see that Marva on TikTok is ready. Zazan on TikTok is ready. Everyone seems to be ready. So let's get straight into it. Now, at this point in scripture, Jesus was on the Mount of Olives. And if we had continued to read, which we could have, even onto verse 9, then you would have realized that it was from Mount Olive that Jesus ascended into heaven. The Bible says that he started to ascend and a cloud received him. In fact, if you'd like, we could just read verse 9 quickly. It says, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the last things that Jesus said to his apostles included the charge for them to not leave Jerusalem, but to instead wait for the promise. Tell to people, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. Momentarily, you'll understand what you're telling that person. But for now, I want you to type in comments, wait, in fact, put it this way, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. Okay? Now, let's break down what was happening here. See, in order for you to really understand why you're going to find that on the day of Pentecost, there were about 120 apostles or may I say disciples that were gathered when the charge was given to about 500 you're going to realize some of the possible reasons why the number was narrowed down to just 120. I want you to listen carefully this evening do not allow anything or anyone to distract you listen carefully so the charge that Jesus gave his apostles for them to remain in Jerusalem came against a certain background. And I want you to understand the background so you might understand exactly what the atmosphere was like in which the disciples were. Listen carefully. So one. Over the past couple of weeks in Jerusalem, the same Jerusalem that Jesus was telling them not to depart from, a lot of things had transpired. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm going to preach tonight. That much I know. Let's break down or list some of the things that had happened in the background. One. We all know that leading up to the time of Jesus' crucifixion, that there was a high demand on his life. Almost every religious sect, S-E-C-T, at the time, wanted to get a piece of him. They all wanted to shut him down, shut down his ministry as well, which would affect all these disciples. They could not stand his gospel they could not stand his teachings. They could not stand him. The said gospel that was bringing about much healing and deliverance in the lives of many was at the same time offending many. And some of the groups of people who were being greatly offended because of their hypocrisy were the Sadducees. The Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sanhedrins, the main group that was responsible for his crucifixion. They hated his guts. So I want you to know that as pressures increased 
for Jesus to be caught or captured. Understand that the pressures were not just being felt by Jesus, but they were also being felt by his disciples. Come on. They were human beings too. I want you to put yourself in their shoes for a moment. They got to a point in ministry when the environment was not safe. Hello? Remember, people were looking for Jesus in Jerusalem. They wanted to kill him there. Now the word was being spread all over Judea. No place was safe for him anymore. But of course, you and I know it was the Father's will for him to be crucified in Jerusalem, the capital. Now you imagine that you're walking with one of the most wanted men of your time. I want you to think about that. Unfortunately, we're not talking about a notorious killer or murderer here. We're talking about Jesus. Yet there was a point when he was the most wanted man in a nation. How come? I know. Let's think about this literally for a moment. That if, God forbid, I see somebody on the news who I know, a cousin or a brother, I don't care how close them is. Hello? And police said they're on the most wanted list. Hello? <laughs> what do you think the flesh gonna do? No, let's be honest for a moment. Let's let's put aside the, the, the gifts and giftings and the anointing and the, the spirit. Let's put let's be fleshly a little bit in terms of how we naturally think. If you see someone you know on the police wanted list, <laughs> immediately you don't know that person. It could be your auntie's son, it could be your mother's son. It could be somebody who lives in the same yard in which you do. All of a sudden, you don't know that person. You never see the person yet, right? Why? Because, practically speaking now, if police is looking for the person, which makes you know already that this is a person who has been committing lawless acts and is a person who is clearly involved in criminal matters okay probably has been knocking heads with other criminals now you tell me if you're going to be excuse me proud to say that you know that person or to say that you are a relative of that person because one of the things that's going to happen to you is you're going to become fearful of what being related to or associated with this person can possibly do to harm you. Who knows? Maybe if police can't catch him, police gonna soon show up at your door questioning you and poor you now have nothing to do with prison matters and jail matters. But next thing you know is jail cell looking at you. There's a fear factor that one has to deal with when someone is wanted and wanted by those who establish and also reinforce the laws of the land. So in the case of Jesus, he was on top of the then government's most wanted list. Think about this. This was not a murderer. This was the Christ. The Bible says a man of sorrow he was. A man acquainted with grief. He had no sin in him. Yet he was at the top of the list of the most wanted people in Israel. So of course... Threats were being blown, not just to Jesus, but his apostles were becoming affected by it. His disciples. Do you remember how on the night of his crucifixion that Peter kept looking on and by him following and watching to see what they were going to do next? 
He found himself in an environment in which he was spotted out. Someone was like, are you not the same guy that I saw with Jesus? So therefore, Jesus was not the only one who was being marked. But all those who followed him were also being noticed. There was a great dislike toward Jesus and his followers. So understand that against the background of all of these sayings and command by Jesus for the disciples to remain in Jerusalem, that the following things had just occurred. One, there was high tensions in Jerusalem and also in Judea, where Jesus was concerned and also where his disciples were concerned. Their lives were being threatened, as you know. So therefore, the environment in Jerusalem was seemingly unsafe for them. Unsafe. They just killed Jesus. And who knows? There are some people who are hungry for blood. They might just want to kill them too. Hello? Now here comes Jesus saying to them, do not leave from Jerusalem. <laughs> In this said Jerusalem where Jesus was telling them not to leave from, other things occurred. Like for instance, on the night when he was arrested, Peter cut off the ear of a soldier. That was a big deal. They did not forget, even though there was a miraculous restoration there where God, through Christ, healed the man's ears. They remember, he cut the man's ear. And that would not have made things look good for them. It would have made them even more a threat to civilians. And of course, to the soldiers and to the religious leaders. Not only that, but on the night when Jesus was crucified, my Bible tells me that Judas committed suicide. So, threats, somebody's ear cut off, Jesus arrested, Judas commits suicide. I want you to understand all the little things that were happening and all the talks. Can you imagine the conversations that were happening in people's homes? If you were to go into someone's home randomly, chances are you'll be hearing them talk about one of the following things. What else was happening in the atmosphere in Jerusalem, the same Jerusalem that Jesus was telling them not to leave from? Our Bible tells us that Jesus' body was taken into a tomb and that a stone was placed in front of the tomb to cover it. But the same Bible told us that on the third day, the stone was rolled away. And because the religious folks, the hypocrites, refused to believe the truth, which is the only thing that sets us free, they said to themselves, we're going to come up with a rumor that one of his disciples came and stole his body away overnight. And so rumor had it that Jesus' body was stolen. In the said Jerusalem, where Jesus was telling them not to depart from. These guys were living against the background of all of these things, these chaotic things. Threats over their heads. People wanting information from them. Furthermore, already they were being warned by religious leaders not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. Don't preach in his name. Do not call his name. If you do, you'll be greatly punished. A lot of chaos. A lot of painful things were happening in the background. This 
said Jerusalem was the place where Jesus himself bled the most. They smote him on his back several times. He bled. He bled. He bled. He bled. He suffered so much in Jerusalem. And his disciples were not at peace to an extent in Jerusalem. Yet Jesus says to them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. Where's the Holy Spirit going with this tonight? Ah, la, 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 ma, sha, and the, uh. Oh, family, the place where you have been hurt the most, the place that has become the most uncomfortable for you, Katariabashata. The place where you have bled the most in your heart, katana nakashaya. The place where you have suffered trauma, makusheketa, the most, hallelujah. Is the place where God wants to honor you the most. He says, do not leave Jerusalem. Because I have a greater glory awaiting you. And the Father has appointed that that glory come upon you in this same place called Jerusalem. It's the place where you've suffered shame the most. It's the place where you've been rejected the most. Yet it suits the Father to honor you right there. So he says, do not leave. Don't go anywhere else. There's something that I want to pour out in you and pour upon you before you go to your next. I know that you've been wanting to change locations. I know that you'd prefer to go to another ministry. I know that you'd prefer to be a part of something else, a different move. But God says, I've not glorified you yet where you are. If you could only just wait just wait a minute you don't have to wait for too long just trust me if i tell you to wait i know that you can do it if i tell you to wait i'll equip you to to wait if i tell you to wait i'll anoint you to wait if i tell you to wait i'll prepare you to wait there's a reason i'm instructing you to wait now i want us to understand something according to verse 4 the Bible says the Lord Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. Now, I want you to write down something as it pertains to that word wait. First of all, y'all know it's a verb. It's an action word. But this verb is taken from the Greek word perimeno. It means to put up with one's surrounding Difficulty. Let me fix that. To put up with surrounding difficulties. To put up with surrounding difficulties. So, to wait, as in to exert or exercise patience in light of difficulties. So, to wait means to not just sit while conditions are favorable. If you were to read the Greek Bible, you'll understand exactly the kind of waiting that was required of them. The Lord Jesus was making it clear unto them that it's not going to be a smooth sailing wait. I'm asking you to wait amidst trials. I'm asking you to wait amidst difficulties. I'm asking you to wait amidst persecution. Now we know why the whole 500 did not wait until the day of Pentecost. Everybody did not have the stamina to wait. Everybody's faith level was not at that place that would have caused them to wait. They were being looked at. They were given the bad eyes. 
As they walked, people were whispering and talking. People were ridiculing them. People were mocking them. And especially there was the talk of the town because there were some fools who did not believe the report that Christ was resurrected from the dead. So there were some fools rather who were believing the stories like, oh, how come he was on the cross but he could not save himself? Yet he claimed he was the Messiah. So whenever those fools saw the disciples, one can imagine the chatterings, one can imagine the ridicule, one can imagine how the disciples were left to feel because of all the things people had to say, not just about them, but also about their master. It was not going to be easy. It was going to be tough. The environment was tense. I want you to put this word in the comments. They needed to wait amidst tension. Do you hear me? They needed to wait amidst scrutiny. They needed to wait amidst persecution. They needed to wait in an environment in which they felt rejected. They needed to wait in an atmosphere in which they did not know who to trust. So Lord, why did you not tell us to go up to somewhere else in Palestine to wait? Lord, why didn't you tell us to go over across the river, across Jordan, somewhere to wait? Instead, the Lord said, uh-uh. In the very place where you have found shame, I want you to wait. Because in that place, you're going to experience your greater glory. In the place where you have lost the most, you shall gain the most. In the place where you have cried the most, you shall laugh the most. In the place where you felt pain the most, you shall be healed the most. In the place where you've been rejected the most, you shall be accepted the most. In the place where you've been dishonored the most, I'm going to honor you the most. And don't think that I'm going to do this thing in secret. I want you to understand that when the day of Pentecost came, everything that the Lord did and the way he did them, oh glory to his name. The things he did, they were done deliberately. Our Bible says to us that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered together in one place. But watch this. Even though they were the only ones who were in the room, when the fire came upon them, tongues of fire, hallelujah, I want you to understand that the power was so strong that the room could not contain them. They were only there for just a moment. The Bible says that it got to a point where people were gathered in Jerusalem. Yes, some of their criticizers were gathered there. Some of their scrutinizers were gathered there. Some of their doubters were gathered there. The naysayers were gathered there. The Bible says that God allowed them to see the power of God come upon the disciples so that the very said people who were speaking all manner of things about them, when they saw them, they could not help but say to themselves, but, but don't we know those men? I, I know that one. Weren't they the same men who were following Jesus? I know these men. I know that one. He used to run up and down in the community. We're from the same village. I know him. He's not learned. These are all unlearned men. They never went to college. They never sat at the feet of any rabbi. I know these men. They are not literate. These men, I know them. Yet in that moment, they could not deny the move of God upon their lives. They could not deny the power of God and the miraculous work 
that was happening on them and in them right before their eyes in the public space. Some of the ridicule probably happened in closed spaces, behind closed doors. But I'm here to tell you that when God is ready to honor you and to elevate you, it's not going to happen in secret. The very said people who have openly attacked you, openly opened their mouths against you, the very said people who have openly persecuted you, hurt you, mocked you, rejected you, dishonored you. The Lord says, right where you are, where you experienced all the various things you've experienced at their hands. I'm going to do a mighty move in your life right there. So some of you, you're currently attending churches and you know that things are not going right at those churches or at your church. The people in leadership don't like you because they see that you're anointed. They see that the hand of God is upon you. Some have started to tell lies on you. Some have carried all kinds of news and information to the prophetess or to the pastor about you. And you know that you're not guilty of those things that have been said. And it has been paining your heart for the longest while now. You really want to leave. But for some reason, you have not gotten any instructions about where next to go. There's a reason for that. God is saying, wait right there a little longer. Because there's something that he wants to do in your life right there, right in their midst before you go. I want you to understand that in the case of the disciples who were charged by Jesus not to leave from Jerusalem, in their eyes, they were having to live in a very dangerous, life-threatening, unsafe environment. What they did not realize was that where God was going to take them next was going to be even worse than where they were in Jerusalem. If they felt like the conditions were unfavorable in Jerusalem, they were going to discover not long from now that the conditions out there in the world and at other places are worse. In other words, you might feel like the conditions in your church now are hostile. Pastor this, pastor that. Prophetess this, prophetess that. And all manner of things are happening that are hurting your heart. You might think that this is the worst. But part of the reason God wants you to stay there until he anoints you and puts his power in and upon you there is so that you'll be ready to face the greater levels of attacks, persecution and opposition that await you out there. Because you have not yet gone out there, you don't even know that such things exist. So part of the reason God wants you to stay where you are so he can endow upon you his power is so that you'll be equipped to face even more hostile circumstances that are out there. The Lord Jesus said unto them in verse 8, he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He says, you shall be my witness and you shall witness unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts, excuse me, of the earth. Let me break that down for you. They needed to wait. 
so that they could face the oppositions and attacks that were right in their backyards, that were right in front of them, the ones with which they were familiar. You know, you have some familiar attacks. You've seen them. This, this is not the first time you're seeing this kind of attack. You, you're familiar with certain attacks. For the most part, when Jesus was with them, Jesus was the one who was dealing with all these because he was the man at the front. Now he's no longer there. And all the bullets that he used to take for them, God forbid, not that he did, but I'm just speaking in that kind of proverbial term. They were now going to have to take for themselves. They were going to have to face their giants. They were going to have to face the beasts out there. Jesus was not there to do it for them anymore. So the preparation was going to see them dealing with the attacks that were closest to home. Those were the ones that were in Jerusalem. Now, little do they know that the further away they were going to go from Jerusalem was the more intense the attacks were going to be. So, of course, they were going through hell in Jerusalem. Probably there were times they felt like they were going to die in Jerusalem. And in their minds, things could not get any worse. Yet Jesus was trying to say to them, the further away you go is the more hostile the conditions will be. So I want you to understand that part of the reason you can't leave that church now is because when you find yourself going to some other church, that from the outside looks like it's all put together. And so you desire to be a part of there. You ain't seen evil yet. You think you can go and look into a church and determine the nature of the church? Are you kidding me? You think you can look at church folks and determine whether or not they're trustworthy? I've learned that the hard way. No. So when you think your brethren are bad and when you think they're hurtful and when you think that they're doing all manner of things that are not Christ-like to affect you and if you're not careful, you'll turn back. I want you to understand Christ is saying you got to remain there for him to move upon you in such a mighty way that when you do decide to go somewhere else, and you're facing some bigger demons and devils, you'll be prepared. Because the further you go from where he has called you is the worse things will get. Do you understand me? So I know she doesn't like you. I know he doesn't like you. I know they continue to overlook you. I know they continue to tell lies on you. But Christ says, let me honor you here first. Let me promote you in front of all of them first. Let me equip you in their midst first. Because see, although you're going to face some greater challenges, the further away you go from this church or from this assembly or from this church family, I want you to understand that at least when you go further away from them, one thing they'll know is that while you're not with them, they'll know for sure that God is with you because right in their midst, God would have honored you. And right in their midst, in front of the eyes of your doubters and your naysayers, God would have put his mark upon you. And it's one that none of them will ever be able to deny. And guess what else? None of them will ever be able to reverse what God would have done in your life. And because God does not want you to embarrass him, because he knows what's out there, you don't. You just think it's peace and safety because you feel like right now you're dealing with the worst people ever and it cannot get any worse than this. But God is saying, you have no idea what awaits you. He's saying, stay where you are now. Let me prepare you for what is ahead. 
Let me equip you for your Judea and Samaria and the outermost parts of the world. Let me tell you a little bit about the trajectory. Christ started with Jerusalem. Again, it was a very familiar place. Throughout Jesus' ministry, they kept going to and fro Jerusalem. So by this time, they were well known in Jerusalem and they were familiar with the environment of Jerusalem. But when God says, you're gonna go even onto Judea, understand that Judea was a landmass that had several towns. I believe Bethsaida was in Judea. Cana was in Judea. All these different territories and towns were parts of Judea. Jesus was telling them that a time will come when you're going to have to move further and further away from what you're familiar with. And the more unfamiliar you are with a situation, sometimes it's the more dangerous it will be for you. Now, it's one thing to deal with Jerusalem, which was dangerous, and Judea, because news was spreading fast. But it was a whole nother thing for them to deal with Samaria. What is it about this Samaria? During the time of Jesus' ministry, there was a rivalry between Israel and Samaria. Or may I say, Judah and Samaria. The dispute was all about where the capital was. So some say the capital of Israel was Jerusalem. Others argued that the capital is not Jerusalem, it's Samaria. So for many years leading up to the, the time of Jesus' ministry and even during that time, there was this rivalry. So it was a known tension that had existed between Judah and Samaria. So understand that the people of Samaria did not like the people of Judah. So part of the reason Jesus' disciples were astonished when they had come to the well and had seen him ministering to a Samaritan woman, not Samaritan woman rather, not only was it against the rule for a woman to be in such close proximity to a rabbi, but they knew in the back of their minds that an ongoing feud had existed. So that ministry at the well occurred against that background. The background of the limitations when it comes on to women and rabbis, and also as it relates to Jews and people who live in Samaria. Do you understand me? So, Jesus was telling them that a time is going to come when I'm going to put you in a very uncomfortable position. Can you imagine how their eyes were widened when Jesus said it? Because already Jerusalem as they knew it then was feeling unsafe. Already they had to be looking over their shoulders in Jerusalem. Now God was telling them that he was going to send them in the, in the lion's mouth. In the lion's mouth. And at least the people of Samaria had a form of godliness. But when he says, I'm even going to send you further than Samaria, I'm going to send you to the other nations that have nothing to do with God. It gets even worse. Because now you're not only going to have to be prepared to deal with church folks or religious folks. But you're going to have to deal with people who will not even want to hear you. It's going to take a special anointing and grace upon your life 
for you to open your mouth and capture or demand their attention. It's an anointing that will do it. That's why you can't just go. You need to be sent. There are people who will walk up to you and slap you in the face. God forbid there are crazy people out there. So you need him to send you. That way he'll send his angels to protect you. And whenever the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible says the spirit of God will lift up a standard. It gets more brutal out there. There are people who will want to literally fight you. There are people who will ask you questions you've never heard in your whole life. So he says, before you go anywhere, wait right here where I've called you first. Right at the ministry where you got baptized. Right where you're serving currently. Stay there. If you've been put to shame there. If you've been mocked there. If you've been rejected there. If you've bled there in your heart. Because of all the things they've done to you. Then all the more reasons you need to stay there. Because your God. Wants to honor you at the place. Where you have felt shame the most. Your God. Wants to elevate you. At the place where you have suffered the most. And where you think is most unsafe for you, God says. It's the most ideal place. For him to crown you. And exalt you. The place where you've cried the most. The place where you have prayed the most. Interceded the most. I promise you, if you'll just wait upon him for a few more days, for two more weeks, for three more weeks, I promise you that God will blow your mind right there. He ain't telling you to go anywhere else because it's only right. That where the enemy sought to defeat you. Where he sought to bruise you and abuse you. That's the place most befitting. For your rising up. For your crowning. For your elevation. If what the enemy has done to you was done openly, don't you think your God is going to honor you openly? He ain't doing it in secret. The Bible says that your God will prepare a table for you in the very presence of your enemies. And when he puts his anointing upon you, your cup will run over. You have an overflow. So where are you running to? Yeah, you heard right that you're going to go somewhere else. You heard right that relocation is coming. You heard right that a move is coming. But not until. The Lord says, do not leave from where you are as yet. Do you hear me? This message is not for everyone. But the person for, for whom it is. You're being convicted right now. Don't leave, no go nowhere. Yet. It's not your time. 
you're going to leave that place with your head held high. You're going to leave that place with people's jaws dropped. The men of Jerusalem were shocked. How could untrained, unlearned, and uneducated people speak so fluently languages that they were never taught? What manner of speaking is this? God is going to pour out such an anointing upon you. He's going to cause such a move of his spirit in your life that people are going to question you they're going to question what they see they're going to wonder if they're really seeing what they see they're going to wonder if they're really hearing what they hear they're going to wonder if it's the same you yes it is the same you who they try to belittle who they try to undermine who they overlooked who they scorned who they underestimated who they did not feel was worthy, who they did not think was qualified. Their jaws will drop because there comes a time when the stone that the builder refuses becomes the chief cornerstone. Furthermore, your Bible says that the sufferings that you experience in this present time are nothing to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you. So the place where you are suffering the most is the place where you'll be glorified the most. The place where you bawl the most, shed tears the most, bleed the most. is the place where you will be honored. Honored and exalted the most. Let me see those of you who want to say yes to Jesus Christ tonight. Raise your hands and say after me, Father, I confess that Jesus Christ of Nazareth came to earth in flesh. He was crucified on a cross for me so that I might live and have life more abundantly. I'm sorry for all my wrongs, my trespasses, iniquities, and transgressions. Lord, cleanse me. Transform my life. Make me into your image according to your likeness. From now onwards, in Jesus' name. Family, tomorrow night, we're going to be here. Perhaps I'll start at 7.30. I believe the sooner I get started is the sooner I can be off getting my rest. So set your alarm because we're going to delve into the holy word of truth tomorrow night again by the grace of God. Ensure that before you go, you click, you hit the like button, make sure you hit share before you go so that someone will benefit from the encouraging words from the Holy Spirit tonight. If you're watching on TikTok, make sure you play your part in giving the video a like as well. Remember that come Saturday, this Saturday, May 25, we're going to assemble in a physical space where many people will be healed, delivered, restored, transformed, saved by the grace of God. Main service will start at 7.30 p.m. at the Double Tree by Hilton Hotel, Boston, North Shore. 50 Ferncroft Road, Danvers, Massachusetts, 01923. That's Saturday at 7.30. I love you all very much. Remember to support the ministry. 
go to the website shadeenanglin.org. There you'll find all the information that you could possibly need from the ministry. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.